Mm. Yeah, for a long time. And today, <clears throat> I want us to look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the secret place. What does the Holy Spirit do, or how do we partner with the Holy Spirit? What exactly is the function of the Holy Spirit in the secret place? So I would like to uh, pick up from where we left off, just a recap. Yesterday, we saw that the secret place is not necessarily physical, as we may call it, but uh, it points to a relationship between man and God. It points to the way we relate with the eternal God, our maker, the maker of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> we read from um, John 4, 22 to 24, where it says, you worship what you don't know, but we worship what we know. We say the hour is coming, and now is when the worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. So um, today, they talk about worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. So let us uh, just delve deep into what the Spirit of God does or how he helps us in this way. Uh, we are going to take our first reading from John 16, <clears throat> from verse 7 to 15. And it says, John 16, 7 to 15. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient, it's expedient for me, for you, that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to the father I go to my father and ye see me no more verse 11 of judgment because the prince of this world is judged i have i have yet many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now howbeit when he when he the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall he, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will and he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has a mind, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. <clears throat> now, from this excerpt or from this portion of scripture, uh, we learn that the spirit leads us in the way of truth. <clears throat> so the way of truth in this context is the testimony of Jesus, <clears throat> which we can call the written word of God. Because we remember in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says in the beginning, there was the word, the word was with God, and the same word became flesh, <clears throat> which points to Jesus Christ. Now, in John 14, John chapter 14, it says, uh, John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In this scripture, Jesus is talking about himself as the way, the truth, and the life. We want to know the way of the truth here, in which the spirit leads us as we um, get locked up or as we enjoy the great romance in the secret place with the Most High. In John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, it says, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And <clears throat> you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the Holy Spirit here he guides us in all truth. He bears witness through uh, in us through conviction in everything that we do. And this is what guides us in everyday decisions that we make every minute. Um, bear with me that in everything that you do, somehow your spirit bears witness. There are things that you do and you feel like somehow you are antagonistic with your spirit. You just had to oppose or to force yourself to do what you are doing. And usually such things are not good. 
it may not be wicked per se, but somehow the spirit is telling you, you shouldn't be doing such a thing. But <clears throat> you get to a place <clears throat> where, you know, man was given a free will. You can choose to obey the spirit of God or not. But the spirit does not stop. Once we confess that we are born again, the Bible says he, we are given that deposit of the spirit. And now it is that deposit of the spirit that convicts us and keeps us leading on through teaching us many things as we are going to see. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <clears throat> so a sound mind here is that sound which sticks to the truth. It is morally upright, no matter what, even under pressure. It doesn't matter what the circumstances dictate. It doesn't matter what the situation. People say the devil tempted me. Before he tempted you, where did he find you? And even when he tempted you, you know, being tempted is not the problem. The problem is succumbing to the temptation. When you give up and you, 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 you succumb to that temptation and you fall prey for the, for the devil. So, but the spirit himself here in this verse, he has given us the spirit of, of power, of love, and of a sound mind. When we talk about power, this power is that which is made perfect in our weaknesses. He gives us strength to overcome the things that were overcoming us. He gives us power to do things that we could not do in our own mortal bodies or in our own strength. And love, you understand that many atrocities that people commit are against humanity. People are bought, they um, malice, they do witchcraft, they do all sorts of things, steal from one another. And this is because they don't have love for one another. If you woke up one morning and you looked at your neighbor and you saw yourself in their eyes, I believe you wouldn't want to hurt them. Jesus, I think it is the Bible that says that treat other people the way you would want to be treated. So, <clears throat> but the genesis of that is love. If you do not have love, how can you treat that neighbor the way you would want to be treated? We are talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the secret place. Romans chapter three, verse three to four. He says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, verse four. Yeah, let God be true but every man a liar, as it is written, thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. <clears throat> Every day we meet people, the world is full of evil people. We work with them. They are safe to say they are even in church. We come into contact with them and the public is always looking at us and they keep wondering how we do certain things we do. To them, it is normal for a man to have two wives. It is normal for a man to, to steal. It is normal for a man to take a bribe or to give a bribe. To them, it is normal for a man to, um, to, to return evil for evil. But for us, <clears throat> there are certain decisions that we make. And we are in such days where good is taken for evil and evil for good. People, when they look at what is bad, they assume that it is good. And it is the Holy Spirit that convicts us or that preserves us. And because of that conviction that we have, he gives us the strength that even though other people are doing it the other way, you will not go the same way. It is the Spirit of God that gives us power <clears throat> not, to, or not to do or not to go the same way as other men or as normal men do. We are not normal men. We are beyond normal. We are supernatural beings existing <clears throat> in the flesh. Now, we need to uh, get to, to understand that the Holy Spirit, he convicts the word of God upon us daily. Many people will bear witness that daily scriptures keep popping up in your heart every day, <clears throat> every moment. The more you get familiar with the word, the spirit keeps on grasping those things. Even when you're not familiar with the word of God, somehow by morality, he tells you, you cannot do that. You cannot behave like that. There is a notion in the public where people always ask, hey, this guy behaves as if he's not born again. 
you know, everyone knows that the born agains are supposed to set a standard. So the moment we get born again, there are things we are not supposed to be doing. There are things that we used to do before we, we got born again. <clears throat> but when, as we got born again, we can no longer do them. And how, how, does, how is it possible? It is not we, it is not of our own power or not in our own energies or else we would boast. <clears throat> but it is because of the spirit of God. Now, um, in the most holy place, because we can a secret place and skip talking about the temple. In the most holy place, there was, uh, we all know that the temple had three portions. There was the courtyard, the holy place, and then the most holy place or the holy of holies. So in the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant in which they put the two tablets of stone. And on those stones, <clears throat> God wrote with his, his finger. And these tablets of stone, they represent the heart of the of, uh, me, of a born again believer. There was the pot of manna, which was also a shadow of God's grace to come upon or to be bestowed upon a believer. Then there was also Aaron's rod that buried, that budded, which was a shadow of the spirit, of the fruit of the spirit, which men ought to bear, not of themselves, but through Christ, because men, we are mere flesh, and men are susceptible to sin. But through Christ, the apostle says, I can do all things through Christ that gives me the strength. In Jeremiah 31, <clears throat> Verses 31 to 34. We are going to be having lots of scriptures today. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. He says, Behold, the day, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, but we but um which my covenant, which, sorry, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. 33, but <clears throat> this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will, give, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Before uh, we go any further, let me also take this reading from Jeremiah 32, because um, somehow it relates with what is being said in this scripture. So in Jeremiah 32, verse 38, it says, and they shall be my people, and I'll be their God. And I'll give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of men, and for the, and for, for the good of them, and of their children after them. 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I'll put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Now, when we look at these scriptures, they're all pointing to the new creation in Jesus Christ. Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, behold, if any man is in Christ, they are a new creation. So this is the creation that is being pointed to here. We became... In this New Testament, we became the embodiment of the most holy place. How? The law of God is resident in our hearts because it is inscribed in our hearts. In our hearts, he said, I'll put my law in their inward parts and I'll write it in their, on their hearts. Now, it is written in our hearts. Now, he said, you will not do the, uh, he will make a new covenant, not as the first one. The first one, you remember, it was on tablets of stone. But in this second covenant, God himself with his finger imprints his law on, on our hearts. And then he says that nobody will teach the other that know ye the Lord. Why? Because we have already the law of God in our hearts. And the spirit himself teaches us. The spirit teaches us daily. This is how 
preachers get someone and even other people who do not even preach they are spoken to you read your bible and the spirit of god begins revealing things to you why because he's teaching you every day the law of god is within you is embodied within you you no longer have to refer to the tablets of stone because the bible says i think in the book of romans for what the law of the flesh could not fulfill the law of of the spirit fulfilled in that the, the law of the flesh was weak how was it weak it dealt with the leaves or with the fruits and did not deal with the fruit or with the roots so if you are dealing with a fruit and and you cannot go and dig down to the root then there is a problem this is what uh, jesus christ came to do in in i think in one of the epistles of john he says for this reason was the son of god made manifest that he may destroy the works of any of the enemy what are the works of the enemy to destroy that fruit, sinful nature in man so men are carnally born with that sinful nature but when we confess christ he gives us the spirit and the spirit himself through the cleansing of the blood he begins to instruct us in the way of the lord even without our pastors even without the prophets even without nobody in your room the spirit of god even in your office wherever you are even as you're driving the spirit of god is pointing to certain things <clears throat> there are certain times you answer someone in a rude way then after you feel like something is pricking your heart and that is the spirit of god speaking to you and saying jesus won't do that <clears throat> so the revelation of the pot of manna is the grace of god which causes us to do according to the good will of god and preserves and sustains us the manna was not kept it was not meant to be kept overnight you remember the instruction if you go and read i think from the book of exodus numbers the manna was supposed to be eaten you collect what is enough for the day once you keep it or once you kept it overnight it would uh, have worms in the morning <clears throat> but this particular pot from the day it was collected and put in the ark of the covenant it was not i mean it did not get spoiled it, it was not eaten by worms why because it was in the presence of god it was being sustained by the presence of god this is the believer being sustained by the grace of god because of the grace of god we are not consumed and it is the presence of god that preserves us it preserves us from wickedness from ourselves actually the greatest deliverance a man can ever have is the deliverance against their own selves the bible says that we behold the word of god as in a mirror our image every time you read the word of god you you stand up to your own self and you see certain things that no man could even point to even when they would you you would at times be, become defensive of certain certain things but as you read the word of god and begins piercing piercing your heart it cuts and begins dividing you then you get to a place where you surrender and somehow there's things that you let go the the things that are unnatural to man for example if a man abuses you and you just look at them you either bless them or you keep quiet and go out another man will say what are you up to you better give them a fist in their face but you know what it's because you have gotten to a place of circumcision the bible says that the circumcision after the flesh profiteth but but not that much but now we ought to be circumcised in our hearts so as we point to the grace of god we cannot skip reading psalms 91 <clears throat> since we read verse 1 yesterday so i will begin from verse 2 to today and we shall read to the very end it says psalms 91 from verse 2 i will say of the lord he is my refuge my fortress my god in him will i trust you remember we began he who abides in the secret place of the most high now here surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence and he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust this i mean his truth shall be thy shield and buckler thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flieth by day nor of the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor of the destruction that walketh or that wasteth at noonday a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10000 at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee verse 8 
Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil, there shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the, lion, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me. Now answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. And with long life, verse 16, I will, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, when we talk about the grace of God, one of the definitions of the grace is that unmerited favor, undeserving favor. Now here, we do not deserve all this, being kept, the Lord uh, in this psalm, he promises ultimate protection. Talk about wickedness, talk about malice of men, talk about spiritual wickedness, talk about anything that we strive with, even from your own self. The Lord, the Lord has promised that he shall protect us. And he says that no evil shall become near us. Where is evil? Certain evils are in our hearts. Certain evils are from without. So in whichever way, the Lord protects us because of his grace. Now, I am um, not an expert in chess, but at least I've ever played it, that chess game, if you know it. So on a chess board, there are so many pieces, but there is one piece that is supposed to be kept, I mean, protected from attack. And that is the, the, the piece that they call the king. So there is always what they call a safe square. A safe square is that place where the king cannot be attacked. Now, once the king is in check and it doesn't have any other safe square, then they will say checkmate and the game is over. So likewise, the presence of God, we live as that king piece here on earth, but the presence of God is our safe square. Once you leave the presence of God, you become vulnerable. The grace of God is what sustains us. The Bible says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord, not by might, not by power. You are so powerful, yes. You are mighty, yes. But there, there are certain things that your power cannot do. There are certain things that your might cannot avail. And it will only take the spirit of God to take you there. And now that which the Lord is doing by his spirit, it is what we are calling the unmerited favor, the undeserving favor. And it, the grace also represents the divine power that works in us, the divine power of God that makes us alive or that works in us. So in this place, he says, not by might, <clears throat> not by power, but by my spirit. In Psalms uh, 124, from, we shall read from verse one to the last verse. He says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had, sw they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the, <clears throat> then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey, as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers, and the snare is broken, and we escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and the earth. Remember in the other, in the precedent scripture that we read, he said that he shall deliver you from the fowler's snare. And here he's also talking, he's saying that we escaped as a bird out, out, out of the fowler's snare. Now, escaping. He said, I will show him my salvation in the last verse in, in Psalms 91. Uh, with long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. Here, we're just saved. 
we escaped from the fowler's snare, which is the fowler's snare here. The devil lays traps every day. The first trap that he laid was to take us down to hell with him. That one we escaped when we, when we confessed salvation. But every other day, the devil keeps on laying other traps. Today you are into this trap, you overcome it. The other time he sets another trap. Maybe you, you are caught by that trap, you fall down, but the grace of God picks you up. He does not, he does not give up on you. The Bible says, I mean, there is a certain song that we usually sing, uh, the reckless love of God. It says there's no wall he cannot kick down, no shadow he cannot light up. There's no mountain he cannot climb when he's coming after us. Even when we fall down, the grace of God is sufficient. He will pick us up. Somewhere in the psalm says, the righteous shall fall seven times, but he shall arise. So in number seven is a number of completion. Even when we feel that we have fallen completely, as long as you still have that faith in you, as long as you still, have, you still confess and say, I know that the Lord shall redeem me. The Lord shall redeem you even, even in that day of atrocity. So <clears throat> we are preserved because of this covenant that we have with God and the Holy Spirit keeps on breathing upon this covenant every other minute. And like this pot of manna that is in the ark of the covenant, and that's how we are preserved and we are not consumed. It is the grace also that helps us to bear fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Aaron's, Aaron's rod, if you go back and read uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, it was put in the presence of God. It stayed one night. And in that one night, it, it budded, it blossomed, and by morning, it already had almonds. And God said that they should put that, uh, that, uh, that road in the Ark of the Covenant. This was a representation that, man, in your own efforts, you can never and you cannot, it is next to impossible to bear fruit. It is the fruit of the spirit. So how do you bear the fruit without the spirit? It is more like saying that uh, you can have a whole field, acres and acres of, ma of maize plantation without you getting that seed and putting it to the ground. So this is the fruit of the spirit. And now we are talking about the role of the spirit here in the secret place. So it is the fruit, it is the spirit himself who helps us to bear fruit. A jackfruit tree, what makes, it, what makes it a jackfruit tree? Is because it bears jackfruit. Now, the fruit of the spirit is the evidence that we have the spirit of God working in us. So if we talk about bearing fruit, it is impossible without the spirit of God. Hallelujah. And next, uh, the spirit also helps us in our times of fellowship to commune with God. This is, this. I, even as I talk about this, I feel like I'm taken away. When we talk about communion, there's that place of, um, there's that place of, let me just be blunt, for lack of better literature, there's that, that place of romance between man and God, a place where they have this love. I, I don't know, how to even explain it. But there is a, a place of communion. And when we talk about communion, it is not because you commune with God in prayer. No, it's not because you commune with God when you go to church. Uh -uh. It is much bigger than that. It is deeper than that. A man who has had a revelation of communion with God, communion with Christ, is a man who walks with God. The Bible says in uh, Genesis that Enoch walked with God. And they said there that he lived 365 years as he walked with God all his years. And the Bible says that he walked with God until he was no more. When you go to the book of Hebrews, it says, for oh, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. He walked with God 365 years. We have 365 days in a year. And that's how we ought to walk with God. The walk with God, communion. When you are walking with someone, you commune with them. You have to communicate. You touch, you laugh, you smile, you cry together. It is not about what you're going through. Certain people, because they are going through certain situations in their lives, they think God has departed from them. No, Shadrach, Musach, and Abednego. Even in the fire, God was there. Wasn't God seeing when they were fanning those flames on, of fire? 17 times brighter, or they burned 17 times more than they used to. God was there. 
he was watching Daniel as he was being taken to the den, the dungeon, I mean, to the den of lions, he was there. When he, Joseph was being taken to prison, being uh, sold to the Ishmaelites, being betrayed by his brothers, in all the things, God was watching. So certain times, we should get to a place where we say that, even if he slays me, yet shall I praise him. Even if he kills me, yet shall I praise him. I am moved by, by what Job said. When, they, when his friends were telling him, you know, maybe you sinned, maybe you did this and that. Now you're facing the judgment of God. And in fact, the wife was so uh, open. She told him, you know what? Just, just cast that God of yours and die. Can you imagine? Why don't you tell me cast that God of yours and live? But she tells him, cast that God of yours and you die. It, which means that at this place, death was a better place for this guy. It, he would, I mean, it would be better off for him if he had died other than going through such agony. But you know what? Somewhere he says that I know my redeemer liveth. I know my redeemer liveth. And it is the same statement that Shadrach, Mishach, and Abednego, they say that we know that our God will redeem us, but even if he doesn't, he's still God. The same statement is made by Daniel. And he says that, you know what? My king, my God shall preserve me even in these lions. And then guess what? In all this, Job, when it got to a time when his testing was over, do you know what he said? That you know what? He was restored twice as much as he had. The Bible says nobody had beautiful daughters like he did. Let's go to Shadrach, Mishach, and Abednego. The king himself stood and said, behold, we threw three men in the fire, but I see a fourth one, one like the son of man. And the Bible when he's referring to Jesus, he calls him the son of man. In fact, he himself points to himself and says, the son of man shall suffer these things. And you know what? He was with them in the fire. And when they were brought out of the fire, the king declared that all Babylon would worship the God of Daniel, the land of the Chaldeans. And uh, uh, Daniel, when he was brought up from the, the dungeon, what happened? The king still declared that all the land of the Chaldeans, land of the Persians would bow down to the God of Daniel. Let us talk about Joseph. When he came out of that dungeon from the prison, after all that long suffering, you know what the Bible says? He was made second to Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh said, no man shall lift up his foot, imagine, without your consent. And he said, you, I will only be greater than you by the throne. He got his signet ring and gave it to, to Joseph, which means this guy was already a Pharaoh. So, what are we talking about here? We are talking about the place of communion. I don't know why I went there, but possibly someone needed that encouragement. The spirit of God is God with us, or as we can call him, Emmanuel, one of the names of Jesus Christ, as I said, I think it is in Isaiah 9, where they said his name shall be mighty counselor, wonderful father, and the increase of his government shall have no peace. His name shall be Emmanuel. So communion, it means association, it means joint participation. It also has a place of intercourse. Um, Paul, in the book of, I think it is in the first Corinthians chapter nine, where he says, you and the spirit of God, you became one. And that is the intercourse that he's pointing to here. So um, there is no way we can relate with what we do not know. That is what John, where we began from John 22, he says, you worship what you don't know, but we worship what we know for salvation is for the Jews. Now, this thing, uh, Paul, I think in the book of Acts, Paul was, um, was in the city of Athens and he said, men of Athens, I perceive in any way that you are very religious and you are devoted men and I've seen altars everywhere, but there's an altar where I saw to the unknown God and he said, now, that unknown God is what I'm introducing to you today. Now, there are people you cannot worship, you cannot commune, you cannot get to that secret place before you know the Father. 
And it is the spirit of God who helps us in fellowship. He reveals the father to us. The Bible says um, in the book of uh, uh, one of the Corinthians letters, the epistles to Corinth. Um, okay, yeah, it is here. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine to 15. But it is written, uh, I has not seen, no ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him, it says, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yeah, the deep things of God. He searches all things. He searches the mind of God. He, in fact, in 11, he says, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of that, of, of, of Serve the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the, the we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, here, knowledge is very key as we talk about the secret place. When we get to that place, somehow I have this conviction. You know, when you set out of the, out, out to the journey, you don't know how it's going to be. You are not definite of the end, but you're sure that when you get there, you will know that this is the place. That is the secret place. We do not know how. We do not know when. But when we get there, we understand. Communion, it's about a relationship. Choose to walk with God. Um, it is Joshua who told the children of Israel, choose yourself who to serve today. But I and my house will serve the Lord. Today, you can choose to walk with God, just like Enoch did. Many people have testimonies in the Bible. The Bible, they, the Bible testifies of them. Elijah, he walked with God until the whirlwind took him away. The men who have walked with God. And it begins from a place of relationship and communion. Let's learn to commune with God. Let's embrace the spirit of God. Let us allow to be led of the spirit. I, I, I remember Elder Paul took many weeks just preaching about that one verse, as many as are led of the spirit, such are the children of God, such are the sons of God. Let us learn, let us offer ourselves. There's a place of sacrifice. There's a place of willingness. There's a place of letting go. There's a place of, uh, you know, there's a place of surrender. There's a place of just being eager. There's a place of eagerness. Let us just learn to be led of the spirit. May God bless you. Over to you, Pastor Paul. Wow. Thank you so much, Pastor Raymond. And we're going to pray in the next few minutes. Let me just uh, emphasize some something that he said. Uh, as you're preaching, Revelations 19.10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See that you do not wash, you do not do it. I am your fellow servant and your, of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, it's amazing how he begins talking about the testimony of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy, but in the same phrase as worship God. Okay, now put in perspective what Pastor Raymond has been saying, and they that worship God, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. Then he talked of God writing the tablet with his finger. And as he mentioned that, immediately I was taken in my spirit to think about, okay, so when he says he's writing on our hearts, what is he using? He's using his finger. People who say that they have never been touched by God. You know, he has written his word in your heart with his finger. So each one of us has a touch of God. But the last verse I want to read for you is uh, Psalms 51 verse 6. And this is David saying uh, after his episode with Bathsheba and all that, he says, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. God desires truth. He says in his word, if you continue in my words, 
then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So as you continue in the word of God, um, and you're not just a lip service person, truth will grow in you. And it also says that that's what God desires of us. Then he says, you should worship me in spirit and in truth. Then he says that, you know, the testimony of Jesus, you know, and uh, worshiping God um, and the spirit of prophecy, they operate together. You know, so it's an important thing for us that as we get into understanding the, the, the beauty of his holiness, the beauty of that secret place, the issue of truth cannot be understated. And truth is not that the way we sometimes see it uh, in terms of what is true, this color is green, this color is blue. No, the truth is as the spirit of God pronounces it in your heart. What are those issues he's been talking to you about? Uh, worshiping him in spirit and in truth means that you accept his leadership and you move forward. That is worshiping in truth. So, and you mute your microphone and uh, <clears throat> the spirit of truth, you know, that's what Jesus calls the Holy Spirit. Um, that the Lord, I must needs go that the spirit of truth may come. Pray that the Lord will give you humility to accept the work of truth in your life. If there is 